This presentation is on iliac crest bone grafting for reconstruction of the bone deficiencies on the reglenoid side in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. I refer to this as the Norris technique because it was developed by Dr. Tom Norris from San Francisco, California. Tom is a good friend and has just recently retired. He's from Fort Worth originally with Oklahoma roots, graduated from Princeton Columbia Medical School, was a hand surgeon by training, but has had a long interest in total shoulder arthroplasty and was a founding member of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons. These are my disclosures. They are found on the AAOS website as well. When I think of revision total shoulder arthroplasty, especially when it comes to glenoid bone loss, I'm reminded of the chicken salad to chicken shit equation. Unfortunately, entropy favors chicken shit, and you have to put a lot of energy and time into these procedures to come up with a good result for your patients. Before there was a term bio-RSA, Dr. Tom Norris described the use of a long posted pegged base plate with hydroxyapatite coating that he developed to use along with an iliac crest graft to use as a one stage revision. Previous attempts by Gilles Walsh and others using a short base plate failed because the base plate did not achieve fixation in the native glenoid. This is a video provided me by Dr. Tom Morris, an edited video which shows initially removal of a hilomer clinoid component, which was well known for its creation of osteolysis. Following this, the glenoid bed is prepared with a curette, irrigation, and all polyethylene wear debris is removed. A smooth bleeding bed of bone is created using a dental burr. Period. Following this, we see the exposure of the iliac crest by Dr. Norris, and then a drill hole is created. The crest is reamed as if it were the glenoid surface, and then the long posted base plate is placed into the hole. Period. A small sagittal saw is in use to cut around the base plate and its peg and the hiliac crest is harvested. Extra cancellous bone is utilized to fill the defect and then the base plate and post along with its composite iliac crest graft are inserted into the glenoid defect. Multiple compression screws are then utilized to secure the graft and base plate.
This is an x-ray of a 63-year-old former Dallas cowboy who developed a metastatic infection into both shoulders and his lumbar spine. He had a total shoulder arthroplasty which became infected in this fashion. He had undergone a previous first and second stage revision with persistent infection. This 3D CT aspiration arthrogram details the severe loss of bone on both the humeral and glenoid side. We proceeded with a one-stage Norris procedure with iliac crest graft. In addition, we performed a latissimus dorsi transfer as described by Lepiscopo. Video. Okay, lift it back up. Okay, now what? Up and down. Up and down. Up and down. Up and down. And up can and you down. go forward like up this? Up and down. And, and then down. can you rotate it? Rotate it. And the other way? I can rotate the other way. Okay. All right. And you're That's alive. Good movement of it. Yay. Excellent. You did a good job. Ciao. At seven years post-operative, the patient has no pain and reports no deterioration of function. Is pending new x-rays at this time period. Frank Golke reports on 56 cases, 36 of those two-stage procedures. These were all done with one and two stage reconstructions with a high rate of incorporation of the iliac crest grafts using the Norris technique. In 20 patients, because of the volume of the graft taken, a locking plate was required to prevent fracture of the pelvis postoperatively. Iliac crest bone grafting is not without complications. Donor site pain, gait disturbance, and fracture of the iliac crest are all risks and are generally related to the size of the graft taken. Two experimental studies investigated this topic and recommend that the graft should be harvested at least 30 millimeters posterior to the anterior superior iliac spine and the length of the graft should not exceed more than 30 millimeters to prevent fatigue iliac crest fracture. Another technique which can be done to limit pain and improve function post iliac crest grafting is to use methyl methacrylate to rebuild the pelvic wall in this x-ray, no rebar is shown, and this methacrylate graft did slip out, period. Using threaded Steinman pins, that complication can be avoided, and the methacrylate built up around the pins, which stay solidly in the pelvis, to prevent graft movement. Not all reports of this technique have been excellent. In this study by Greg Nicholson and a number of other authors, there was a 25% incidence of graft resorption and base plate failure. My sense is that these patients were not done with the original Norris technique using the long posted base plate, but instead a relatively short peg with a long screw, in which case the ingrowth portion of the base plate did not reach the native scapula and explains the relatively high rate of failure period. This also points out the importance of following the instructions and techniques as described by Dr. Norris and ensuring that the porous coated portion of the base plate achieves solid native scapular fixation.
In summary, iliac crest bone grafting is an important technique in revision shoulder arthroplasty, but is not without some patient morbidity. The iliac wing does show increased stress in the harvest site being 20 to 25 millimeters posterior to the ASIS. No more than 30 millimeters should be used. Therefore, use a 25 millimeter base plate when using this technique. The use of a peg or the shank of the screw with ingrowth material must be long enough to rest inside the native glenoid period. This step is critical.